Amy, I am Dr. Chavalala, and I'll be um, presenting on cancer screening in women and when, what, and how. So the top five cancers um, that affect women in Sub-Saharan Africa are actually breast cancer, 27.1% as uh, per Global Can 2020 uh, latest data, but in our uh, National Cancer Registry statistics, um, it's at 23.22%. So the first column is as per statistics from Global Can, and the second column is from our National Cancer Registry, which was last updated in 2019. The cervix cancer or cervical cancer accounts for 18.7 and 15.85 in South Africa. Colorectal cancer is third on the list at 6.3 and 4.46% 4, 4, uh, in South African women. And you'll see that the uterus cancer has a higher prevalence um, in South Africa than uh, other Western countries, namely America. <clears throat> the commonest risk factors for cancers in female patients or other patients across the board is a strong family history uh, or medical history of, of, of malignancies, especially if you have uh, pathogenic variants of genes that are prevalent in your family. Obesity also plays, plays a big role. Um, reproductive history, you find that with breast cancer, if you're nearly Paris or you have um, uh, had one or less or, or two pregnancies, you're at high risk of developing breast cancer. And if you haven't breastfed, those are one of the risk factors for developing breast cancer. And we know that with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and most of the cancers, colorectal cancer too, there's an increased prevalence of these cancers with advancement of age. And also previous treatments can put you at increased risk. So radiation therapy to the thoracic cavity can increase your breast, breast cancer risk, especially if you've had in your second and third decade of your life. And then it puts you at risk at developing breast cancer around the ages of 40 years and above. Physical inactivity, alcohol and smoking, we know that these um, recreational drugs do cause increased ox oxidative stress on your body cells, and then hormone replacement therapy and some of the diets. So just a brief overview of breast cancer uh, prevalence. We know that globally it's the most diagnosed malignancy in female patients. In America, they've got a lifetime risk of one in eight women that will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. And according to our National Cancer Registry, as I said, it was last um, updated in 2019. I think the 2022 or 21 update has actually recently come out, but it's the number one diagnosed cancer in females. And in the US, it accounts for 260,000 new cases and 40,000 deaths each year. However, because they've got very uh, good screening programs, um, they are having a decrease in their death rates at an average of 1.8% yearly. The aim of breast cancer screening um, is to perform um, the screening process in women that are asymptomatic, so have no signs and symptoms, in order to detect breast cancer at an early stage. Because we know that if you detect breast cancer at an early stage, you will indeed reduce the morbidity or mortality of the disease. The components that are involved in breast cancer screening will include a medical history, a family history. We know that if you've had previous breast cancer and indeed you're either BRCA1 or 2, or, or, or two mostly BRCA2 patients, they have an increased um, risk of uh, breast cancer recurrence, either ipsilateral or to a contralateral breast. Also, <clears throat> another important um, individual or or, or, or rather giving patients autonomy of their own screening as breast cancer awareness. It's very important that um, female patients know their, their, their breasts and know what's normal and know what's not normal. And they should actually um, monitor their breasts and uh, acquaint this, themselves with what's normal. Uh, and in most instances, you find that the patient themselves will pick up their abnormality or their partner will indeed pick up the abnormality and alert the patient to 
um, the abnormality, then the patient will screen further. There's also breast cancer risk assessments. Um, they are models that will then uh, uh, predict your, your risk of uh, developing breast cancer. Then there are many models that are freely available on the internet. But the problem with these models is that when they were developed, they were developed around Caucasian patients and they don't um, cater for our diversity, uh, you know, in, in our ethnicity as well. So it would be nice maybe if we had more risk assessment tools that could cater for our population and diversity. There's also clinical breast, breast cancer examination. This is usually done with the risk assessments uh, models. It's usually done by a healthcare uh, professional, either in the primary health care uh, setting or indeed in one of the breast, uh, uh, ca uh, breast cancer clinics or by an oncologist. It's readily available on the internet. Breast image plays an important role in screening. And for women that are above the age of 50, the mammography is, 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 is sufficient. But you find that with younger patients, you often need other forms of imaging to better define what's in the breast tissue because younger females have dense breast. So we usually do an ultrasound and the better one to do is a digital ultras ultrasonography of the breast. However, in some instances, there is um, a motivation for young women to go for MRIs as well, but more as a confirmatory measure than a screening measure. So our asymptomatic patients that are screened have to be risk, risk stratified. They either have an average risk or an increased risk. And females that have an increased risk will usually have either a prior history of breast cancer or very strong history, family history of, of, of breast cancer, increasing their risk by 20% of developing a breast cancer. Women that are more than 35 years of age will normally with the risk models um, that are available, have, your, have a five-year risk of developing invasive breast cancer of one, more than 1.7%. And then, of course, women or anybody that's received radiation to the chest wall has um, a, a lifetime risk as well that's increased, especially if you've got radiation uh, along the ages of 10 or 30 years of age, it then increases your risk from the age of 40 of developing breast cancer. And anybody with a, a, a genetic predisposition that has been indeed confirmed. Average risk women um, need to be screened, but there's no real benefit of screening them as it's been shown. Um, I mean, don't necessarily need to be screened as it be, it's been shown that um, women less than 40 years of age don't really benefit in terms of decreasing morbidity and mortality of developing or, or of breast cancer per se. And for them, their screening does not necessarily need to occur, but you can just have risk reduction counseling, counseling the patient on breast awareness and ongoing risk assessment um, uh, profiles so that the patient can be better, have better knowledge and better be better equipped to know how to notice what's normal or abnormal. But in these patients, if there's a strong family history and they are over the age of 30, then indeed they probably need to then go to a primary health care provider to then get clinical breast examinations, maybe once a year, up to three yearly. Around the ages of 40 to 45, there's no strong recommendation, but there's a qualified recommendation that often these patients may indeed have abnormalities in the breast that possibly are cancerous, but not necessarily cancerous. And the benefits need to be discussed with the patient, whether or not, um, you know, there's, there's risks to starting mammography at an earlier stage, because we know that mammography is actually an X-ray. So the risk to the breast of starting uh, screening at a younger age is also uh, something that you need to alert the patient about. But otherwise, if there is a strong index of suspicion, then the patient can have annual mammography. Um, and in young patients, we know that mammography does not pick up all the abnormalities in a young dense breast. 
So at times we might have to also gently do a, a, an ultrasound, digital ultrasound of the breast to pick up the abnormality. If there is a suspicious lesion or there's inflammatory breast cancer without a, an underlying um, mass, the patient can also be sent for uh, an MRI as a confirmatory test. Over the age of 45, um, there is an absolute benefit. Most um, guidelines will say from 50 years of age, the absolute benefit starts to kick in. But from the age of 45, a lot of studies have shown that there is a, a reduced uh, risk of mortality from breast cancer if you uh, have early detection. And this you do with annual mammography plus minus ultrasound of the breast. And of course, an MRI is debatable and you can always discuss it with the patient and as a multidisciplinary team. We then know that um, with our high-risk patients, there's normally, you can see that, right? With our high-risk patients, there's normally either hereditary cancer syndromes, which are characterized by a definitive gene mutation that is highly um, associated with the development of breast cancer. This is because these genes that are pick, picked up with hereditary uh, cancer syndromes have a high prevalence to um, ev eventually uh, develop into a cancer. Meanwhile, the familial cancer syndromes usually involve BRCA1 and 2. So with BRCA1 and 2, the, the syndrome, the cancers that are often um, prevalent is breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic and prostate cancer. With the hereditary type of um, malignancies, you've got Lynch syndrome, which we know is a, uh, um, in, in our patient, is a um, um, hereditary non pulposis um, malignancy, where you've got high MLH and MSI immunochemistry findings, um, along with a mismatch. Um, repent uh, defects and also other abnormalities. Um, and then with Lynch syndrome, we have a high propensity of developing gastric and colon cancer, as well as others like pancreatic cancer. And the others leave from only, you find that a patient has two different malignancies um, diagnosed either concurrently or after each other. And there's other syndromes as well that are related to hereditary cancer syndromes. With high-risk patients, we've already mentioned this, that they have already features that put them in that high-risk category. And the recommendation of patients with higher increased risk um, uh, pr uh, probability of developing breast cancer, we usually say the screening should start 10 years prior to the youngest diagnosed family member. But under the age of 30 years of age, there's no real benefit in starting the screening process. And of course, in patients that have been irradiated earlier on in their life, you also start screening 10 years post the, the treatment, the radiation treatment. Screening in women with high, high risk stratification um, is usually um, with annual mammograms or, or ultrasound, uh, ultrasound of the breast. And in this group of patients, you can actually uh, motivate more for doing MRI as a screening. However, it's not the standard of care. It's just a motivation that you probably don't want to miss an inflammatory breast cancer or a subtle um, pre-malignant lesion with microinvasion. There is indeed an increase in male breast cancers when uh, there's an association with a, a family history. So in the familial cancer syndromes and hereditary cancer syndromes, you do get a high risk of male uh, breast cancer, although male breast cancer worldwide only accounts for 1% of the breast cancers. But you find that in Central and Eastern Africa, there's a slightly high incidence of breast cancer in males at about 5%, and this goes to some syndromes that can occur there, like Kleinfelter syndrome, and any um, cause or any drug or other chronic disease that can cause low um, androgen and high estrogen levels in those males. I'm going to now talk about ovarian cancer and its screening and risk. We know that um, the, the commonest variants um, or variants that can occur, just like in breast cancer, there's also a familial cancer 
syndrome risk and then a hereditary cancer uh, uh, risk syndrome risk with BRCA1 and 2 genes um, leading to, um, of course, the high risk of developing either ovarian or breast cancer syndromes. Most of the ovarian cancers are sporadic in their diagnosis, but we find that, especially with BRCA1, 20% of ovarian cancers may be diagnosed because of a pathogenic variant of BRCA1, of the BRCA1 gene. There's other pathogenic genes that can cause ovarian cancer, and those are related to those hereditary causes that we had seen, the, the Lynch syndrome, the Lefrobani, and the other, um, and the other um, hereditary cancer syndromes. In ovarian cancer, the risk models are similar to those used in breast cancer. However, because of our population, they are not too helpful. But in our Caucasian and probably colored community, they can be a bit more helpful in risk stratifying patients. And with the latest data, we've seen that microsatellite instability and mismatch repair deficient tumors lead to high suspicion or lead or prompt the, the, the clinician to actually then send the patient for genetic counseling and testing. Because in most instances that these patients with um, microsatellite instability and mismatch repair will have a pathogenic uh, gene mutation that gives them uh, or puts them in a higher risk of developing ovarian cancer. As I said, for BRCA1 uh, mutations or, or familial cancer syndromes, there's a higher propensity of developing ovarian cancer than BRCA2. BRCA and this is more in the uh, Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry uh, people. And the problem though with screening procedures, um, I stand to be corrected by, <laughs> Dr. Smith, but it's there's no standard of care for ovarian cancers um, or, or level one evidence for ovarian cancers because um, to screen is can have a lot of false positives. For instance, a CA125 can be raised for a number of reasons. You know, the patient can have um, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, can have other cancers in other parts of the body that are not necessarily ovarian cancer it can be raised. And as for the age of when you diagnose, so if the patient is high risk um, or falls in the high risk category, then the age is the same as the high risk for breast cancer, high risk patients with breast cancer, where you would um, start screening the patient 10 years prior to the youngest family member that was diagnosed. So with breast and ovarian cancer, there's always rich risk reduction management strategies. Um, there's modifiable risk factors. We know that, as I mentioned, the risk factors um, that can cause cancer, a high BMI, some of the dietary components and alcohol and smoking. So a healthy lifestyle and modification of um, your lifestyle and also exercise are one of the modifiable risk factors. Although they don't 100% prevent you from getting the malignancies, but they aid in, in, in decreasing your risk of developing the cancer. Other risk reduction um, uh, measures, or you, you, I know Prof. Dimitri has written an article on giving agents like your, your uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen, which is a first generation uh, serum. There was a study, a P1 study that showed that if you gave tamoxifen for five years, um, to, to women that are of increased risk of developing breast cancer or women that were yeah. over the age of, of 35 did in fact decrease in the short term the risk of developing invasive breast cancer um, by 43% after a seven year follow up, but they were giving the tamoxifen only for five years. Um, also the tamoxifen benefits these women in that um, it spares their bone health um, because it's, it's got estrogen content. And the more benefit was seen more in patients that had BRCA2 uh, mutations than in BRCA1 mutated patients. Another modality of reducing risk of um, breast cancer uh, um, development, especially in high-risk patients, is risk reductive surgery. However, I think this measure needs a discussion with the patient. We've got other measures that we can put in place and these patients can really be monitored closely 
um, you know, with with the mammogram or, or sonographic investigations, and also the risk stratified on an ongoing basis. Going on to cervical cancer, it is the second most common cancer in women in sub-Saharan Africa, with one in 41 women having a, having a lifetime risk of developing um, cervix cancer. We know that with cervix cancer, it usually occurs in people of low income um, in our countries and uh, in African countries more commonly. And this is just related to low socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, um, there's a variety of reasons, and I don't want to pinpoint it to, to one ethnic uh, uh, background, but also the, the increases Pay, the the, the co-infection with HIV and also the, um, the 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 risk of having multiple sex partners. We know that with um, cervix cancer, from the precursor lesion to the invasive lesion, you have a slow progression. So if you are exposed to a a, a, a virulent uh, or um, uh, oncogenic HPV um, strain. It can take 10 to 20 years for you to develop um, cervix cancer. And we know that the commonest risk factor is human papillomavirus. The commonest strains that we see in South Africa are those that are, are listed there 16, 18, 31, 45, and 56. They have the highest oncogenic potential. And then others like 6 and 11 have low oncogenic potential. It's important to note that those that have high oncogenic potential don't only cause cervix cancer, they can also cause genital warts, they can cause penile cancer, they can also cause head and neck um, cancers, especially in patients that do uh, partake in oral uh, sexual um, uh, practices. <laughs> And of course, the co-infection with HIV, multiple sex partners, and parity has a role as well to play in cervix cancer. Multiple uh, pregnancies do increase your risk of cervix cancer. And like with breast cancer, the less uh, uh, pregnancies, the more the risk. With cervix cancer screening services that we have, according to our national uh, health guidelines, we only are providing services for 12.8% of our population, and we could do better. Um, I hope we are, we are doing better by now, but obviously the main goal is for us to rather do preventative measures with our screening than to do, because um, we know that with more advanced cervix cancer, um, these patients often don't do well and don't respond well to treatments like chemotherapy. And in fact, there's novel agents, but with that too, the responses are not great. So with the preventative measures, we obviously have primary preventative measures, which are in our young adolescent girls, where they have not been hopefully exposed to sexual uh, practices, and they are able to get the HPV vaccine. There are also secondary measures where patients have already been uh, exposed to HPV infection, and we rather reduce the incidence to getting invasive uh, carcinoma of the cervix. Or we, and indeed, if we reduce that, we, then we reduce the morbidity and mortality of this cancer. Also important is, you know, once patients have cervix cancer and they are not <clears throat> curable, it does put a strain on our healthcare system. So in the national cancer, the South African national um, health cancer um, national health guidelines, they've put that their target population to start screening is from the age of 30 years and older. I think that this should change. And because we know that in our population, we have the HIV infection. And in fact, younger females are, are already um, sexually active by the age of 25. So according to the um, American Cancer uh, Association, they are starting their screening at the age of 21. So we should definitely also improve our age at, uh, when we start the screening. The WHO recommends that the HPV DNA-based uh, test be the preferred method. We're still using mainly the cytology in, in the form of the pap smear. 
However, with, with the WHO, they feel that, you know, um, although the HPV DNA um, test can have a lot of false uh, uh, positives, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a quicker test and it's objective, you know, it doesn't need somebody to view the cytology specimen and make a decision whether there is an abnormality or not. So the age of onset of screening, according to WHO, is 30 years for um, uh, every five to 10 years. And if there's HIV co-infection, they've said that the, the screening should start at the age of 25 every three to five years. And um, with the South African health, gui uh, health guidelines, they recommend the age of 30. And they say in a, in a woman's lifetime from the age of 30, she should, she should at least have three pap smears. So meaning one pap smear every 10 years, whether this is sufficient, I think it needs to be reviewed and they need to also acknowledge the HIV co-infection. Um, and then obviously our screening procedures can also um, improve at the moment. We're doing a lot of uh, pap smears. And um, obviously if you've got uh, low grade um, squamous intraepithelial intra lesion, um, uh, then you, you probably, or, or they pick up the precursor lesions, you probably need to repeat your, your pap smear. And if it is indeed positive, then you can go for diagnostic colposcopy. In the high grade self as well, you probably need to go for colposcopy once the atypical lesion has been picked up. This is just the, the American guidelines for the uh, cervix cancer screening. And then obviously HPV vaccine infections are preventable, especially if we start uh, with our vaccination programs. However, I feel that our vaccination programs can actually um, include older females because then you've got a higher um, advantage of preventing invasive lesions um, across the board and decreasing our cervix cancer prevalence. Um, and the rest is a bit self-explanatory. Um, with CDC, they've increased the age to 45, but I know this, there's a, a, a presentation about HPV vaccination, so I look forward to hearing that presentation. Thanks. Okay.